Now, folks, if you've got a cell phone on you, would you please silence it or shut it off? The only call I want to get right now is from the Holy Spirit. All right. So, uh, I feel the Lord wants us to be in the Galatians chapter 5 today. I, I wasn't sure where we were going to be, but I, I just really sensed during the worship this is where we'd like to be, where He wants us to be. Guys, you know we're in a time of, uh, in our lives when the battle lines are being drawn, when, when, where, where there's no gray anymore, you know. It's, it's, you're either in with Jesus or you're out. You know, there's too many people walking the fence. And uh, guys, when, when this thing comes, when, when everything caves in, if you're on the fence, the fence goes with the destruction. you got to get off the fence. Who Jesus is, you need to make the, the decision. Jesus asked the P Peter and the disciples, who do, you, who do the people say that I am? And the people said, well, some people say you're John the Baptist, some people say you're Elijah. And then the Master said, who do you say that I am? So I'm asking you today, who do you say that Jesus is? Because who you say Jesus is will determine your destiny. It will also determine how you live your life here on earth. We're living in a, in a, in a I mean, I can't hardly believe some of the things I'm seeing right now. And it's just absolutely, it's just like in, in one year or two years, we just, we've fallen so far. So I want to be in Galatians chapter 5 today, and I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to, to speak to our hearts. And uh, as a matter of fact, I want you to make this your declaration. Repeat after me. Dear Lord, Dear Lord speak, to my heart, speak to my heart. Change my life. Change my life. In your precious name. Your precious name. Amen. Amen. So uh, Galatians chapter 5 was written by Paul. So I've got the King James and I've got the, I've got the, um, what do I want to call this one here? I tell you, this one I've been using for prayer for my quiet time. I like it very much. The Passion Translation. Uh, because it just it puts it in such an intimate way. And for uh, uh, some, of, some of the scripture, we'll use that today. But Galatians chapter 5, Paul's writing to the Galatians. He says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again to the yoke of bondage. So here's what he said. Let me put that in this translation. Let me be very clear from Christ who set me free. Not partially, but completely and wonderfully free. We must always cherish this truth. And stubbornly refuse to go back to the bondage of the past. I like that. Stubbornly refuse. I'm not going back, people. I don't want to go back to the Steve I used to be. Why would you? You know dogs vomit, and then they'll go back and they'll eat their own vomit. So do people. Why would you go back to what God has set you free from? You know, I don't know a lot of people, if you were in jail and someone broke you out of jail, you're going to go right back to jail for the next day. You know, oh, I'm not comfortable in this bed. I'm going to go back to my cop. No, God has set you free from the prison of your sin. You don't have to live this life anymore. He has set you free. Romans tells us that you have been set free from the curse of the law. You're no longer bound to it. When a man and a woman are married, by law, they're married. And, uh, and they're married, but they're supposed to be married, until death do them part. Now, when one dies, the other is free to marry someone else. Because that law is no longer binding to them. When we came to Jesus Christ, we died to that old relationship. And now we have a new relationship with Christ. I don't have to, I'm not married to the law, I'm not married to sin anymore, I'm married to Christ. Literally, literally, I mean. On this finger, I've told you before, it's my wedding ring, I've been married to my wife for 34 years. Uh, is that correct? 34, yep. And, uh, and I tell you, well, you know. And on this ring, I've been married to Jesus for 34 years. 1985 was a great year for me. Because I, I got saved, and, and I got married. And uh, we, my wife and I weren't always living the right way. But the year that I got saved, God set things right. The year that you get saved, the day that you get saved, you need to set things right. So, well, now I get to go to heaven, so I'll just keep living in sin and fornicating and doing all this. No, you cannot. You don't have to go back to that sin. It's the sin that got you in trouble in the first place. 
So behold, Paul says, I say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now he's speaking, uh, and, and I'll give you this other translation. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. So he's saying, okay, you think you're saved because you were circumcised because God made a covenant with Abraham, but that doesn't save you. You need to be saved by God's grace. You need to be circumcised in your heart. You need to be changed. Paul says, I, then Paul, tell you that if you think it's a benefit in circumcision and Jewish regulations, or some of us, we think we can be good enough, you're acting as though Jesus, the anointed one, is not enough. I say it again, emphatically, if you let yourself be circumcised or under an obligation to fulfill every single law. In other words, he's saying, if you are going to be saved by that circumcision, you better keep the law perfectly. And I'm going to tell you something, you can't. The Bible tells us in James, if you broke one letter of the law, you broke the whole law. So if you broke one law, you're guilty of breaking all the law. So you say, well, I never killed anybody. Oh, really? Have you ever hated somebody? Jesus said, if you've hated someone in your heart, you've committed murder. You say, well, I've never committed adultery. Really? Have you ever looked at someone lustfully? Because Jesus said, if you could, if you looked at someone lustfully in your heart, you've committed adultery in your heart. Well, I've never stolen anything. Mm, really? Did you steal anybody's time? You ever steal pencils from work? I mean, we all are. We're all a bunch of thieves. That's what we are. We're a bunch of reprobates. What's what we are? We were raised that way. We're, you know what? We're selfish. First thing most kids t learn to say is, mine. I want that. That's mine. Take it. I've seen kids take and pop someone, you know. No, give me that thing. So, but we're no longer obligated to that. Thank God we're saved by God's grace. So the law didn't save me. I'm not, I'm not obligated to the law. Jesus saved me, and I am obligated to Jesus. I want to live my life for him. If I die preaching the gospel, would that be the way to go? Wouldn't that be something? I heard of a man of God one time, he had prayed for somebody who was really sick. This man had a special gift of healing him, uh, for people. He was 80, 88 years old now and been serving the Lord for, for 48 years. He didn't even get saved until he was 40. And he just asked this brother, he was at a funeral for someone else, and he asked this guy in front of him, hey, well, what about that guy I prayed for last week? And when the guy turned around to answer him, he just kept going. He just fell right in his arms and went to heaven. And so, what a way to go. I heard of a preacher one time was preaching a funeral, and he said to his people, listen, I could, I could die today. And he preached that funeral, and gave an awesome message, a salvation message, sat down, and he died. When I'm in South, Jesus was saying, well, I just had to bring you home, man. <laughs> I just had to bring you home. So, so we're not obligated to the law, people. The law shows us that we're wrong. And if you don't think you're wrong, let me ask you a couple of questions. Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength? I mean, do you love the Lord with all your heart? If the truth be known, you don't. Who broke the law? Do you honor your father and mother? Maybe today, but you, did you always? So ultimately, we all need a savior. The problem I have with the church in America today is we don't tell anybody they're sinners. We want everybody to feel great. Oh, well, they're good. Go get some Starbucks in the hallway and, and, uh, and you know, keep doing what you're doing. It's okay. And I'm, no, it's not okay. We need to live our lives for Jesus. The problem with the world, I, I told you before, I always remember this because I can still see it. We live in a society that says, I'm okay and you're okay. I saw a billboard one time when Jesus was up on the cross bleeding and badly beaten and the crown of thorns and blood pouring down his face. And the caption said, if I'm okay and you're okay, then what am I doing up here? So, guys, we need to make a choice today. We need to start living our lives for Jesus. Jesus lived his life for us. He died for us. And we should live our lives for him. And if he calls us to, die for him. It's like a transfer. He's changed. I'll give you my life. You give me your life. And I'll give you my life. That's a fair... I mean, on my, from my standpoint, that's a fair deal. From his standpoint, that's not fair at all. Because he gets this wretched sinful, ugly, conspiring, lying, feeding person. And then he gives me holiness. And the Bible says that when we come to Christ Jesus, we're wrapped in a robe of his righteousness. So right now, as a born-again Christian, 
with lots of faults. Your father were to look down at me, you know who he sees? Perfection. Jesus. If you're a born again Christian, Father looks down at you, you're in you're in Christ Jesus, God sees Jesus. So we are no longer debt, debtors to do these things. And it says, uh, Christ, verse 4, Christ is become of no effect to you. Who, uh, whosoever of you is justified by the law, you are fallen by grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. So it's all about faith. We are saved by grace through faith and not at works. It's a gift of God, lest any man should boast. If you are saved, it's because of God's goodness. And this amazing grace that saved a wretch like me and you. That's amazing. Why can you do it? How can you do it? But he's done it. I mean, the work's done, guys. The heavy lifting is over. Jesus carried your cross and my cross for us. Jesus took our lashes for us. Jesus tasted death for us. He took our judgment upon the, on the cross. That's why he could say, it is finished. It is accomplished. I did it. I love them so much, I don't want them to have to go through this. I'll do it for him. That's something. I don't know where it was. I think Billy Graham told a story one time. I believe it was him. He said, there were birds out on a blizzard one night. And then this was on a farm. And he said, these poor birds were so cold. And, and they were just flying around. They couldn't get any shelter. And some of them were dropping like flies. And one of the children said, how can we help them? How can we help them? He says, really, not that we can do you know. He says, if I can open up the bar and hopefully they'll go in there, but, but I can't talk to them. And, the, and uh, he said, but you know, if I could become one of those little barn swallows, I could, I could communicate with them and say, come on, come in here, it's warm. That's what Jesus did. He gave one of us dumb sheep, but he wasn't a dumb one. But he became a sheep. He became one of us to show us the way. And I'm so thankful, guys. I'm so thankful for what Jesus has done for us. This is verse 10. He says, uh, in this other translation, Deep in my heart I have faith that the Lord Jesus, the anointed one who lives in you, will bring you back around to the truth. Now he's saying this to some of you guys because there's backsliders in here. Thank God the Bible says God loves backsliders. But there's some of you guys, and what's a backslider? If you're not as fired up for the Lord as you are today, as you were at one point, You've gone backwards. You're a backslider. That don't mean you have to totally walk away from God. It can't mean you just become lukewarm in your heart. Or you've lost your first love. You've left your first love. If that's you, you're a backslider. Well, here he's saying here today to you that you, you can come back. Deep in my heart, he says, I'm convinced, he says, that God will bring you back to the truth. And I'm praying that you will come back to the truth. One thing I do know, if you're a Christian and you walked away from the Lord, you have no peace in your life. If you've had an encounter with God and you walked away from the Lord, God will give you no peace. And I'll be honest with you, you might get mad at me, but I pray that you guys that aren't walking with the Lord, I pray you have absolutely no peace until you get on your knees and ask God to save you. I don't want you to have peace in this world. Because the only peace that you can ever have is peace in Christ Jesus. So I do pray that over you guys. I pray it over you. If you don't like it, too bad. <laughs> I hope you pray that for me. I hope you pray that for me. That we have no peace until we're the man and the woman that God's called us to be. He said, I'm convinced that those who agitate you, whoever they think they are, will be brought under God's judgment. Dear friends, why do you think the religious system persecutes me? Huh. It is because I preach the message being circumcised and keeping all the law, or is it because I do these things? No, not at all. Is there no longer any offense over the cross? To tell you the truth, I'm so disgusted with all the agitators, I wish they would let it go further and cut off their legalistic influences from their lives. You know, I'm a student of revival, and God is going to bring revival to Omaha. We're on the threshold of a revival. And when this fire falls, and when the revival falls, you'll be surprised who it is that's going to try to stand against it. 
It's going to be a lot of organized church. It'll be people who have big names in the city. It always is. The first person to, to try to ridicule the move of God is usually someone in the church. Because they can't control it. You can't control God. I've heard of the Lord falling on uh, Methodist church, Presbyterian churches, Baptist churches, where the Spirit of God just falls in those places and people get changed. And, and then a lot of the religious folks, they don't like that. I heard of a, of a, a Baptist church where this guy, uh, he got sick and he couldn't uh, preach for a while. So they had this young guy, guy who loved the Lord, he was on fire, he had the fire of God in his heart. They had him come preach because this guy couldn't talk. God took his voice away, I believe. And when this kid started preaching, man, people were getting saved. Lives were getting changed. The Spirit of God was moving in that place. And people were coming to church. I mean, people were coming. Listen, when there's a fire, people always want to come and watch see what's burning. And so then some of the board members came to the pastor and the leaders and said, hey, this kid's got to go. We don't like all this. You know, man, I can't even sit in my own seat on Sunday. Someone's always sitting in my chair. Somebody stole my parking place. I mean, guys, it could get just like that. And so they asked the young man to leave. And when he left, there went Everybody the Lord. Went. The move stopped. Dead in his tracks. I don't want that to happen. It ain't going to happen here. But it'll happen in the city. God is raising up nobodies all over this city right now. He's raising yeah. up people that nobody knows. People who don't have big names. People who aren't known. But, but they have such a earnest desire to honor Jesus. And to glorify God. I'm praying this Sunday down at the Hope Center. On this Thursday. That the Lord's going to light these kids on fire. And then we'll start hearing about these kids out there preaching on the street. About Jesus. Preaching to gangsters. About Jesus. How that that could happen. And I would say praise it the Lord. It will happen. It could happen. I want to step up now. Just go a little bit further into this message. I want to talk to you about some things that are really important. It is going to Galatians chapter uh, five, staying there. But I want to jump up here to uh, 16. He says, walk, this I say that walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the desires of the flesh. If you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. So some of you guys are walking in sin. You know why? Because you're walking in the flesh. If you're reading your word and you're seeking the face of God and you're on your face and you're having intimacy with the Lord, you're not going to get caught up into these sinful situations because you're not walking in the flesh. But when you walk in the flesh, anything's possible. How can God take some, some of you hear about these pastors that fall and some of these men of God and people of God falling? It's because they get out of, of the Spirit and they start walking in the flesh. And when you walk in the flesh, you're going to reap what you sow. Remember something, that part of you that's, that you feed the most is going to be the strongest. You're a spiritual being and you're also a fleshly being. So if you feed your flesh by watching filth, reading crap, hanging around with the wrong people that you ought not to be hanging around with, you're going to reap what you sow. I know a young girl, she used to work for me, she was 15 years old. Just a sweet, quiet little lady, sweet as she can be. A couple of weeks ago, she got arrested for first-degree murder. She's 18 years old right now because she got hanging with the wrong crowd and uh, they killed some guy down in Bellevue. I couldn't hardly believe it. I just about fell out of my... But you know what? She was walking in the flesh. She was walking with the wrong folks. She wasn't going to church. She wasn't seeking the Lord. And you can go to church and go to hell. You know that? Yeah. You can go to hell with a choir robe on, on and you can go to hell with baptismal waters on your face. If you don't give your life to Jesus, if you haven't really submitted your heart to Christ, you know, all that, it's just an outward thing. So you're saying, walk in the Spirit. He said, for the flesh wages war or lust is against the Spirit, and the Spirit itself against the flesh. And these things are contrary to one another, so that you cannot do these things that you would. But if you are led by the Spirit of God, you are not under the law. So if you're led by the Spirit of God, God's not going to lead you into a carnal situation. God is not going to lead you into an adulterous situation. God's not going to lead you to watch pornography. God's not going to lead you to the bar. God's not going to lead you to the dealer. Hallelujah. If you walk in the Spirit, God's Spirit will lead you. 
I have a young friend I've met recently. He's right now over in Dubai. They're having a heck of a time. Lord bless Joshua and Caleb Amen. and get them where they're going. They're going to preach in Pakistan the gospel. And they've got like 50 or 60,000 people going to hear these two young guys preach. But the enemy is battling to get them there. But they're walking in the spirit. God's going to get them there. They're walking in the spirit. And that's what we need to do. You guys just say, I just can't quit sinning. Yes, you can. You just got to stop walking there. Yeah, just say no. Uh, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, stripes, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such the like, of which I tell you before, as I told you in the past times, that they which do such things should not see the kingdom of God. So if you are walking in these and living and you've chosen to walk in these sinful ways, I have to wonder, number one, are you even saved? Did you even get saved? It's possible. Christians make mistakes. But are you just a carnal Christian or have you ever really been converted? Here's what he says here in this other translation. The cravings of the self-life are obvious. Sexual immorality, lustful thoughts, pornography, Chasing after things instead of God, manipulating others, hatred of those who get your get in your way, senseless arguments, resentment, resentments when others are favored, temper tantrums, angry quarrels, and thinking yourself being in love with your own opinions, oops, with being envious of blessings of others, murder, uncontrollable addictions, wild parties, and all of these similar. Haven't I already told you that those who use their freedom for these things will not inherit the kingdom of God? I mean, that's a fact. Listen, we're free. If you're, I'm free. The Bible says, you've been called to freedom, brethren, but do not use your freedom as an opportunity of the flesh, but through love be servants of one another. So we've been called to freedom. We've been set free. But don't use your freedom to go out and live filthy lives. Use your freedom to bring other people to that freedom. Yeah. <coughs> That's the thing. You know, there's some real heroes back in Nazi Germany. <clears throat> there was real heroes in, in uh, France sneaking out Jews, sneaking them out of the country to get them away from the Germans. There were heroes in the South back in the days of slavery. There was underground railroads sneaking people out. They were bringing them to freedom. Well, guys, listen. Everybody that you know out there that's not born again, they're caught in captivity. They're not free. Why would you use your freedom and not, and why wouldn't you use your freedom to bring them also to freedom? And we should live in such a way that someone could come up to you and say, you know what, I want, I want the peace that you've had. I've had people say that to me before. I want to have the peace that you have. And I told them, well, let me introduce you to him. Because Jesus is the peace. Now I he says this, but the fruit of the Spirit now listen, I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I believe in all the gifts of the Spirit. I don't like thinking and drinking, but I like when the Holy Spirit does what He wants to do. But you know what? The thing that really impresses me is the fruit of the Spirit. Because you can fake some manifestations of the Spirit, but you can't really fake this. The fruit of the Spirit is love. When you have genuine love, people know it. You can't fake it. You can fake it to a point, but sooner or later it's going to catch up to you. Yesterday we were talking in a men's group, you know, we are talking about how to get people saved and stuff like that. Well, you know, well, what could I do? Well, I don't know. You got a car? Is there people that you'd like to bring to church or they can't come to church because they don't have a way to church and you can bring them to church, but you don't really want to because it'd be uncomfortable and you don't want to waste that time and your gas is a little bit low. Come on. What could you do? How about picking people up and bringing them to church or, or picking up their groceries for them or shoveling their rock? Doing the things that, that make a difference. <clears throat> Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperament, or temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are of Christ have crucified the flesh with the, with the afflictions or affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another again and envying one another. I just want to finish that with this. In this translation, 
But the fruit produced by the Holy Spirit within you is divine love in all its varied expressions. Joy that overflows, peace, peace that subdues, patience that endures, kindness in action, a life full of virtues, faith that prevails, gentleness of heart and strength of spirit. Never set the law above these qualities, for they are meant to be limitless. Keep in mind that those who belong to Jesus have already experienced crucifixion. For everyone connected with our self-life was put to death on the cross. Everyone connected, everything connected with their self-life has already been put to death on the cross. We must live in the Holy Spirit and follow after Him. So that we may not be arrogant or look down on one another. For each of us uh, is an original. I kind of like that. Listen. There's nothing that stinks worse in the nostrils of God than spiritual pride. Now, God does not like pride. Nothing's worse than spiritual pride. He can smell it for light years away. I want you to know, my friends, that we're living in a time when we have to choose to be different. We have to choose to, to be the followers of Jesus that he's called us to be. We can't have step this anymore. It's not enough just that you come to church on Sunday. It's not even enough that you write a, a check to a charity. It's not enough, people. We've got to get out and touch somebody for Jesus. Jesus didn't call it in from heaven. Okay, listen, I'd like to have a bunch of souls. And let, no, he came down and he showed us how to do it. He made the way. He showed us how to follow the example. He became the Lamb of God. He told us that we must be servants. He said, the greatest among you must be a servant. I believe in servant leadership. I don't believe that people should be served. You know, there's places in this community and there's places all over where the pastor's like a CEO. Now, I personally don't get it. The only CEO we should have is Jesus. The Holy Spirit's the boss around here, folks. But let me ask you this. Is he the boss of your life? Is he in control of your life? Who's the boss? You or him? You ask Him before you do anything? Do you ask the Lord to, to give you direction? Do you ask the Lord to show you which way to go? Or do you tell Him how you're going to go? And you ask Him, now listen, I'm going this way, and I want you to bless me. That's not how it works. The Bible says pray about all things. So I want to encourage you. I want to see Omaha absolutely rocked by the Spirit of God. I want to see Omaha, north, south, east, and west, and Bellevue, Council of all these areas, on fire with the gospel. But it's going to happen when we get on fire with the gospel. Yeah. Revival starts in the heart of one person. When your heart gets on fire with revival, and you know what that is? That's when you examine your own heart and say, God, am I the person you want me to be? Am I living the life you paid for me to, to be, to live? Am I still struggling with that same old sin? Is my life revolving around me, or is my, is my life revolving around you? There's a lot of questions you can ask yourself, and if you be honest, and you answer them honestly, you'll see that you're a long way from where you ought to be. Jesus died on the cross so that you could walk in intimacy with God. That's why. Jesus, Jesus died to become the bridge. When man sinned, God and man could not walk together anymore. They were separated. The Bible says God can't look at sin. So the Lord sent Jesus down and he stretched out his arms and he became the bridge. So now you can take the hand of Jesus who can take the hand of the Father and join us together. Amen. And without Jesus, you can't have that. So brothers and sisters, I pray today that you will count the cost. <coughs> that you'll make a decision today that you are going to walk in the Spirit and not gratify the desires of the flesh that you're going to stop living things. Don't do things you know Jesus wouldn't do. Just don't do it. And ask God to make you the person he wants you to be. It's time, people. It's time. We're in 2019. We're already in March. We're in the third month of this year, which I believe God is going to move so powerfully in this, this year, but we're already in the third month. Look how much time has already gone away. Before you know it, it's going to be August. And I hope by the time we're in August, we're in full revival.